My name is Elaine Westbrooks, and I'm the University Librarian and Vice Provost for University Libraries. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to Wilson Library Special Collections. Um, this event is an amazing event, and we are so happy to kick off Going Viral Symposium. And over the next couple of days, together, we will learn about the lessons that impact of the 1918 global um, influenza pandemic. And so wh what I'd like to do is acknowledge and thank the symposium sponsors, the uh, Gillings Public, S Public School of Global Public Health, the Institute for Global Health and Infectious Diseases, the North Carolina Museum of Natural Science, RTI International, and University Libraries. I'd also like to thank our wonderful performers out there. They were amazing. Uh, give them a hand. And I just wanted to list their names again because they were just truly amazing. Um, Isaac Bolter on piano, um, Mara Howard Williams on, on vocals, and the actors were Julia Gibson, Katherine Jones, and Jonathan Olivares. So they did an amazing job. So it's, it's especially meaningful to have this event here at Wilson Library, Library. And libraries are fundamentally about documenting evidence. We document evidence, we um, curate evidence, and that's how we understand history. So the 1918 influenza pandemic had an impact on North Carolina. And um, that was apparent in the state, but it was also apparent here on campus um, because two presidents of the university fell victim to the influenza. And I hope that you take a moment, um, if you go back out in the lobby and make a left, you'll see some glass display cases. And there we have some documents that are part of our collection that um, are documenting how devastating this pandemic was to the to the state as well as to the campus. So I'd like to acknowledge a few people who have done some amazing work. Um, these are my colleagues. Um, Bob Anthony, who's the curator of the North Carolina collection. He's done some wonderful work here. Um, I also like to um, acknowledge Nandita Mani, who's the director of the Health Sciences Library. And uh, Don Lucas, who um, created the virtual exhibit that's online. So if you haven't gotten a chance to see that exhibit, it's really cool, and she did some amazing work on it. And then finally, I'd like to um, thank Terry Rhodes, who's the uh, Senior Associate Dean in the College of Arts and Sciences, who also helped make this event possible. So it's my pleasure now to introduce the host and moderator, Bob Lewin. Um, Bob is the Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost here at Carolina. And he holds a position as the Bryson Distinguished um, Professor in the Eshelman School of Pharmacy. Um, Bob is a um, award-winning researcher. He's an amazing educator, and he's a world-renowned innovator. And um, please join me in welcoming Bob Lewin. Thank you very much, Elaine. It's uh, particularly fitting that we um, have this Go Viral Symposium start here uh, tonight uh, in this uh, beautiful uh, building. It, uh, its location uh, more or less symbolizes the essence of the next few days. Here in the heart of the campus, uh, metaphorically, it represents all that is truly great about this university, bringing uh, faculty, staff, and students uh, from the arts, from the humanities, from the sciences, together to uh, reflect on one of the most important uh, moments uh, in our history. It's also uh, somewhat ironic uh, that here we are in the uh, Wilson Library, uh, named uh, after um, Lewis Round Wilson, uh, who uh, happened to live to be 102. Um, quite a, a, a paradox, considering that uh, today we're reflecting on, in many uh, ways, uh, the many lost lives 
that uh, really took place uh, during the, uh, the tragic 1918-19 uh, 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 pan epidemic. And so uh, this, this building uh, serves uh, an, an interesting uh, place uh, for this uh, great uh, uh, event. Also, uh, we are at the heart of the campus. And uh, during that, the period, uh, immediately following the, the, the deaths of two university presidents, this university enjoyed one of its greatest expansions uh, during the 1920 through 1930 uh, period. Uh, increasing the number of physical buildings uh, that were uh, expanded on this campus by nearly 31, including this building that was built in 1927 through 1929. So in many respects, you are all uh, a part of history uh, just by being in this uh, great facility. And I've had the pleasure, uh, and Elaine has taken me on just a fantastic uh, tour of, of this building and have had a chance to observe for myself some of the amazing collections that are here within this building. So in many respects, this is the perfect place to have this Go Viral Symposium start. So it's a, a real pleasure uh, for me uh, to introduce um, our, our first speaker, uh, Edward E. Covington. Uh, a, a native uh, of, uh, of North Carolina, Concord, North Carolina, and currently uh, resides uh, in Greensboro. A historian and biographer, author of more than 25 works of history and biography, including a, biographer, a biography of former governor and U.S. Senator Terry Sanford. So with, uh, without further ado, uh, let me introduce uh, Howard to you. Um, well, <clears throat> after your introduction and the comments outside, uh, there's really nothing I have left to say. <laughs> um, this was an unusual period uh, for the university, and uh, I happened to um, get into it or become acquainted with it through a book that is in production. Uh, as part of a series of uh, biographies of the presidents of the university that uh, are being produced um, by the library uh, under the supervision of Bob Anthony. And um, I happen to be working on um, uh, the uh, uh, biography of Edward Kidder Graham and Harry Chase. We combined the two since Graham's tenure was cut short by uh, uh, his death in 1918. And uh, I followed, and we continued that with, uh, um, included that with Harry Chase's uh, service as president during the 1920s. <clears throat> I want to mention a couple of relevant things I found on the way. You always, the wonderful thing about libraries is what you find on the way to looking up something else. <laughs> and um, I, I just wanted to, since I'm kicking off here, see, I, most of my, um, most of this territory is new, except for those who've preceded me with all the uh, news about the presidents. But <clears throat> some of you may not realize that uh, what a wonderful medicine Vicks VapoRub was back in 1918. Its uh, value in um, dealing with the ravages of the flu are still disputed, but sales of Vicks VapoRub increased from $900,000 in 1917 to $1.9 million in 1918. And I also read, <coughs> ran across another interesting little tidbit that, uh, can you hear me? Um, an interesting tidbit that I, uh, uh, just shows you how nice people can be. A sheriff's deputy uh, came upon the largest still ever discovered near High Point, North Carolina in October 1918. And posted at the still was a note that declared that the entire run was being used to alleviate the suffering of the flu. <laughs> <clears throat> Unless the moonshiner got back there first, I guess. There was also a fight between the state's um, um, U.S. senator, who was a very powerful figure, figure Furnival Simmons, and the state public health officer, uh, Simmons, used his influence to allow the importation of rum 
uh, into North Carolina from Virginia. At that time, this was before Prohibition, but Green North Carolina was dry, totally dry. And William S. Rankin, who was a state public health officer, said alcohol has no effect whatsoever in dealing with the, um, with the flu, and um, uh, the rum would, did not get into the state. So what was the impact of this pandemic on the university? In short, three things primarily. It demonstrated the need for better health care for the university community as about 300 people fell ill and seven people died ultimately, including our two presidents. It highlighted the lack of uh, sanitary living conditions for students who were crammed into uh, uh, some pretty close quarters in old dormitories. South building was a dormitory. East, west, new west, new east. Uh, where they had very limited toilet and sanitary facilities. Uh, this area from here all the way up to the top of the hill was undeveloped woodlands. And if you were a student and you woke up in the morning and you were late for class and the few toilets weren't working in Old South, you just hit it to the woods. So this was one big latrine out here. <laughs> but more profoundly was the consequences of the, of the uh, epidemic and a series of events that installed Harry Chase as president of the university. He was a man whose tenure was both unexpected and transformative in about equal measure. But let's back up. In September 1918, this was a university in name only. It was, in fact, a military camp. The entire university was under the command of the Student Army Training Corps. And a military officer, a colonel, was in charge of this campus. Just two weeks in, in the middle of September, men started turning up at the campus infirmary complaining of symptoms. By the end of the month, the campus was under quarantine. About 300 men altogether became ill, and at one time there were 130 in beds, either in the infirmary or elsewhere around the campus. As mentioned earlier, doctors McNider and uh, Mangum, faculty members at the medical school, and the second year medical students provided the medical care. At that time, the university's medical school was two years only. So, um, they, these students had at least one year of training. Edward Kenner Graham was president in name only. Uh, he, was, uh, he was the older cousin of a Graham who became much better known, Frank Porter Graham. He was a tall, thin, angular guy, handsome, pleasing, with a very consoling countenance. He loved sports. Uh, he was an excellent tennis player, but in his first year as president in 1914, he tamed the rowdy world of college football and returned to some sanity to the intercollegiate play. He was a practicing Presbyterian, like all but one of his predecessors in office, and he believes the Sermon on the Mount was as relevant in his lifetime as it was when delivered 2,000 years earlier. He was a truly inspiring leader for students, faculty, alumni, and average North Carolinians who he encouraged to become engaged in public service. He was adored by faculty members, most, many of whom had taught him as an undergraduate or worked with him as an instructor or as an associate professor, assistant professor or full professor, and later as dean of the College of Liberal Arts where he was when he became president in 1914. His cousin Frank, called him the greatest teacher he ever knew. In the fall of 1918, he was uh, <clears throat> relieved of running the, the university because this was not a university at that time. It was a student army training corps. And he was given the job of setting up ATC programs at campuses around the South. He was just back from a trip to New York in the mid-October and he returned home ill. One of his friends stopped by to see him at the president's home in the evening of the 19th. Graham was not feeling well and he fingered a bottle of patent medicine as they talked. He left, Graham left later, the, uh, that was on a Saturday. On Monday he let, left to go to Raleigh 
uh, where his SATC office was, and he was back here by Wednesday and gravely ill. He rallied some, and then his heart gave out on Saturday the 26th, and he died. The entire state was stunned. I don't remember reading of another public figure in North Carolina in that era who had such a following all across the board as Edward Kidder Graham. Combine Terry Sanford and Jim Hunt and Bill Friday and even Jesse Helms and other political figures who have had an influence on North Carolina and you have Edward Kidder Graham. He was buried two days later in a brief graveside service just down the street from the president's home in the Chapel Hill Cemetery. Marriage ceremonies and funerals, any kind of indoor programs like that were discouraged during the pandemic. Marvin Hendrick Stacy was Graham's Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and the trustees named Stacy as acting president. Um, <clears throat> he was technically called the chairman of the faculty, but he, they gave him the powers of the presidency. His task was huge. Within a few weeks, two weeks, the war ended, and Stacy was charged with putting this campus back together again. When classes resumed in January, no one was sure who would be show up. Many men were still in military service, although they were being decommissioned. Um, it was unclear just exactly what kind of student body the campus would have. But nonetheless, he had to put together a program and take it to the legislature within 60 days, which he did. On January 14, 1919, Stacy was in Raleigh meeting with the trustees, and he left to come home, and he fell ill. A week later, he was dead from pneumonia, which was a byproduct, as you know, of the... Uh, pandemic. In his place, the trustees named Harry W. Chase as acting president. Chase had been, <coughs> had been assisting uh, uh, Stacy during those two months of preparation, so he was not an unknown quantity. But he was a native of Massachusetts. He'd been educated at Dartmouth and had a doctorate from Clark University. At Clark, he'd been mentored by G. Stanley Hall, who was the nation's preeminent psychologist. Hall had invited Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung to Clark in 1909, and it was Chase whom he asked to translate their lectures and see the, to their publication. Chase arrived here on this campus in 1919 to teach in the Department of Education. He became a leader within the extension program that Graham had championed. He gained respect of his peers, and his work carried him really to many corners of the state to um, where he got to know the state's teachers and educators. Like Graham, Chase was tall, prematurely gray. Few would have suspected that he was only 36 in 1919. Quiet, unassuming, somewhat shy. He did not have the, he was not the orator that Graham was, Yet he had a gravitas within the academic community. The leading candidates to succeed um, Graham as the president were R.D.W. Connor, who was a contemporary of Graham's and who had trained as an historian, and Josephus Daniels. Daniels had served as Woodrow Wilson Secretary of the Navy, and he was the publisher and owner, of course, of the Raleigh News and Observer. Chase emerged as a candidate only after the faculty, his supporters within the faculty, met with the, the trustee search committee and lobbied on his behalf. Nonetheless, Connor remained the favorite. On the eve of the trustees meeting in June, the state attorney general reported to the board of trustees that neither Connor nor Daniels were eligible. He had found a 1909 law that prohibited a governing board, such as the Board of Trustees, of nominating or electing one of its members to a position of leadership. All of a sudden, Connor and Daniels were out of the running. They, uh, Connor's people tried to postpone the election for six months, uh, 
until January, the following January, when he would be eligible, but that failed. Chase won on the second ballot. So consider this with me now. Fate and the trustees have put the future of this university in the hands of a man born, raised, and educated in New England. He was a Yankee. And as far as anyone knew, he might also be a Republican. <laughs> there were reputed to be a few on the campus. He wasn't a Presbyterian, although he was a close cousin. He and his wife attended, were Congregationalists. Most certainly he was an academic, a man trained in research methods with incredible credentials and the requisite citations for the professional work. Graham and Chase came from different backgrounds and experiences. Graham was steeped in literature and culture, in the state's culture and history. Graham studied the science, uh, pardon me, Chase studied the science of teaching. Chase had an earned PhD. Graham, a master's degree. Chase had this experience of a research university. Graham's training was largely limited to what he had learned on this campus as an undergraduate and graduate student. Graham was a man of the heart. He inspired students and faculty through his chapel talks and his quiet counsel. He had empowered students with the installing of self-government. For half a decade, he had focused on remaking the image of the university following the tragic death of a freshman during a hazing incident in 1912. The university was for all the people, Graham argued. He saw to it that farmers' organizations were invited to the campus. He was involved in the social welfare movement, and he became wholeheartedly, was wholeheartedly behind the university's extension program. He championed women's suffrage and hired the first woman to serve the small contingent of female students and connect the university to women's groups across the state. Her successor was Marvin Stacy's widow. There was no pension plan for, <coughs> for deceased college professors. She was hired by Chase to serve as the school's first dean of women. Graham believed the boundaries of the state were coterminous with the boundary, pardon me, the boundaries of the campus were coterminous with the boundaries of the state, meaning the entire population of North Carolina was to be served by this university. Graham had awakened the state to the potential, but it was Chase who would finally make that meaningful. When Graham died, UNC was a little more than a large liberal arts college with three small mediocre professional schools, medicine, law, and pharmacy. Graham had ideas and plans for the future, but a stingy legislature and the onrush of war had limited its options. In the decade of the 1920s, Chase turned UNC into a bona fide university, both in size and purpose, with a reputation as the University of the South. His theme was a familiar one of today, teach men how to live as well as how to make a living. He expanded the footprint of the campus with roughly five and a half to six million dollars that came his way, came the university's way in the first half of the 20s. Included eight dormitories for men, one for women, five classroom buildings, this building, the library, and Memorial Hall, as well as Keenan Stadium. The campus was no longer a hodgepodge of buildings. They were arranged by purpose and function. This area here was the academic uh, area where, class, uh, where the classrooms were. Dormitories were over here. The enrollment tripled by, to about 3,000 during Chase's years. He recast the law school with academically trained faculty and secured its accreditation with the American Bar Association. He expanded the graduate school, developed the School of Commerce, and brought the University of North Carolina into the Association of American Universities, one of 24 such schools in the country. He elevated the status of women and hired the first women in the faculty, something Graham had not even talked about. He brought Odom, Howard Odom, to the campus to head a new school of public welfare. Odom then created the Institute for Research and Social, Service, Social Sciences. 
under Chase, the university press began to work. Chase is probably best remembered as a defender of academic freedom in the face of a legislature that was intent on criminally punishing teachers who taught Darwin's theory of evolution. In 1925, publicly, Chase publicly opposed what was called the pool bill when ads of other states, state institutions and colleges were silent. Chase drew his strength from William Lewis Petit of Wake Forest who had already faced down the anti-evolutionist within the Baptist two years earlier. Chase's genius was to fully embrace his good fortune and build the foundation laid by Graham. He had the tools that Graham did not, but mostly he understood the difference between what a university meant and what a college was. He had, mentored, he had been mentored by the creator of the first university devoted solely to research at Clark, and he brought those standards and rigor to the Chapel Hill campus. He took the money provided by the legislature and moved UNC ahead, not <coughs> as a leading institution in the South, but as a leading institution in the United States with new fields of study in commerce, drama, music, psychology, sociology, social sciences, and support of graduate school. Today, Edward Kidder Graham is not as well remembered as his younger cousin. Most would probably tell you that Graham Memorial, that building up there on Franklin Street, Street honors Frank. It doesn't. It's for Ed Graham, as he was known. Harry Chase is barely remembered at all. He left in 1930 to become president of the University of Illinois. He went from there to New York University, where he retired. He died in 1955. On this campus, a dining hall carries his name. <laughs> Chase once reflected on his tenure as president and remembered the exciting days in the 20s and said he and other men stuck out their necks, took risk, and accomplished more than any thought they could. One of those who was important in all of that was Lewis Round Wilson, whose name is on this building. Chase's strength of conviction and his commitment to academic standards of the university are well worth remembering to even today. At the height of the battle over the pool bill, Chase was asked what effect he thought his public opposition to the bill would have within the legislature, among the legislators, um, within, on the university's fortune. I don't know, he said. I hope that it will have no effect. But if the university does that, doesn't stand for anything but appropriations, I, for one, don't care to be connected with it. Essayist Gerald Johnson wrote that Chase believed North Carolina wanted the best university possible, and he set out to build it. He gambled on the good sense of the people, Graham Johnson wrote, and he won. If the pandemic had not taken Graham, he probably would have continued as president, perhaps for another 20 years or more. The university would have grown and it would have expanded. That was going to happen anyhow. North Carolina had recently introduced public high schools and more young people were eligible for college. Frank Graham probably would have remained in the classroom as a teacher of history and never have had the pulpit of the university presidency to influence an entire generation of leaders like Bill Friday and Terry Sanford. Chase probably would have left sometime in the mid-20s for a job in governance at another institution. He was inclined that way. Ed Graham may eventually have left for another form of public service, even elective office. Perhaps Mac Gardner's replacement for Lee Overman, who died, the senator, state senator, U.S. senator, who died in office in 1930. Although Graham, Gardner had strong personal reasons to name Cameron Morrison instead. A likely successor, had Graham left, probably would have been Connor, the one who had lost the election in 1919. He became a part of the faculty, a member of the faculty, and was a favorite of the trustees for his steady hand and conservative outlook. Connor and other traditionalists worried aloud in the mid-20s about all the outsiders who were joining the faculty <laughs> and bringing <coughs> non-Southern influences to bear on the student money. As it happened, the trustees gambled on Harry Chase, who provided the stone to the fire of Ed Graham 
and place the standard of the university among the leading universities of the nation. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was terrific. Coming from a, uh, a New Englander. <laughs> You know, we, uh, we, we mentioned earlier uh, how important uh, it is on this campus uh, to be collaborative. I look uh, across uh, this audience and see uh, colleagues from so many of the different uh, schools across this campus, once again uh, typifying the highly collaborative culture uh, of this campus, but also uh, the collaborative nature of this symposium. When you uh, think about uh, uh, having a, a pandemic like this, uh, how many different uh, professionals and, and scholars would be necessary to, even in today's uh, standards, uh, be able to uh, address uh, the many challenges that such a pandemic uh, would create uh, for us today? And I can only imagine uh, you know, what we would be able to do today uh, with the strong interdisciplinary uh, culture that we have along with the emerging uh, domain of big data. Would it have made a difference? Uh, would we have uh, reduced uh, that number from 50 million to uh, a much smaller number? There was a, a, a casualty um, at the, uh, in Chapel Hill uh, in uh, 1918. Uh, and it was not Thomas Wolfe, but it was his brother, uh, Ben. And, uh, and his passing uh, had a uh, profound uh, influence uh, on him for the rest of his life, and it ref was reflected in many of his works. At this time, I'd, I'd like to introduce uh, Paula Glant Eckert, um, a, um, a scholar of uh, Thomas Wolfe's work. And uh, it's, a, it's my honor uh, to introduce her um, as director of the American Studies Association. Uh, she is professor, associate professor uh, of English at UNC Charlotte. Uh, editor of the Thomas Wolfe Review, past president of the Thomas Wolfe Society, author of Thomas Wolfe and Lost Children in Southern Literature. Uh, please uh, welcome uh, Paula Gallant uh, Eckerd, uh, and she will speak to uh, impact of the 1918 flu in the life and literature of UNC alumnus Thomas Wolfe. Please join me in welcoming Paula. These microphones always make me nervous. I taught a class not too long ago and used one for the entire semester. I'm going to put it in my pocket because I had a hearing impaired student in the class. So I would hook up the microphone in my office, go to class, turn it on, teach the class, all was well. Except for one day, I'm going down the hall. I've put my microphone on, and I meet a student in the hallway, and we go down, and I forgot what we were talking about, you know, chit-chatting. <laughs> we walk into the classroom, the entire class is laughing <laughs> and looking at me, and I realized I had turned it on in my office, and they, it picked up all the way down the long hallway. <laughs> So they said, we heard you. Uh, and I said, well, you're lucky I wasn't talking about you or, or that I wasn't cussing. So, so ever since then, I've, I've been mindful of, of um, these, these type of microphones. I'm really honored to be here tonight to talk about Thomas Wolfe and the flu. Uh, and I'd like to thank Dean Reimer for inviting me and for her staff for all the hard work they did to get me here and also I'd like to thank the Wilson library staff and, and Bob Anthony and the North Carolina collections people uh, for all that they do to uh, manage Thomas Wolfe's uh, collection here uh, and including supplying me with a few photographs which you'll see uh, tonight. I first learned about Thomas Wolfe long before I was an English major or an English teacher. Uh, I had always been an avid reader, but I had not read any works by Thomas Wolfe until my husband and I visited the Thomas Wolfe Memorial in Asheville 
uh, many years ago while I was still working as a registered nurse. And you can see just how long ago that was <laughs> with the mini skirts at the time. Uh, but when we visited, uh, we came with our three young sons. This is a, a photo of me and, and the baby, William, on the front porch of the memorial, which was my first visit and his first visit uh, to the Thomas Wolfe Memorial, which was a boarding house that was owned and operated by Tom's mother, Julia. <coughs> the boarding house uh, serves as a primary setting in War Wolf's first novel, uh, Look Homeward Angel, and it figures prominently into the flu story that was included in the novel. Uh, uh, here's a, a photo of the a business card that his mother had. Uh, I love the, the line on there, no sick people. <laughs> Apparently, this card was found, this is actually a replica that I obtained at the memorial during a recent visit, but we were told that the, when they had the great fire at the Thomas Wolfe Memorial several years ago, they were doing the renovations and the cleanup, and they found this business card down inside the wall of the kitchen, and salvaged it and then made replicas to give out to tourists like me. While we were at the memorial that year back in the 80s, my family and I also went in search of the famous wolf angel uh, with the statue that is included in the title of the novel, Look Homeward Angel, and is uh, the statue that uh, Eugene Gant's father has uh, inscribed and it uh, now stands, so the real wolf angel stands in the Oakdale Cemetery in Hendersonville, North Carolina. So we went searching for that. Uh, it was quite a memorable visit that afternoon. My older sons were running amok in the cemetery among the gravestones and the baby was trying to crawl through the bars of the fence uh, surrounding the angel statue and the grave that, where that was placed. As most of you know, Thomas Wolfe is perhaps North Carolina's greatest literary son. Besides Look Homeward Angel, he's also well known for the novels that you see here. Wolfe also wrote shorter works, including stories, uh, dramatic pieces, uh, and novellas. Some of you may have seen this film last year. If not, I highly recommend it. It captures the life and career of, of Thomas Wolfe. It stars Jude Law as, uh, as Tom Wolfe, uh, uh, Colin Firth as his editor, Maxwell Perkins, at Scribner's, and Nicole Kidman as, his, as Wolfe's lover, Aileen Bernstein. Thomas Wolfe was the youngest of eight children. Um, let me go back. Oops. was the youngest of eight children of W.O. and Julia Wolfe and spent his childhood and adolescence in Asheville. However, at the tender age of 16, he left the mountains and headed to Chapel Hill. 16, uh, a freshman, probably one of the younger ones, uh, if not the youngest one on campus. Uh, he studied here and graduated at the age of 20, and I thought you might like to see some photos of him from his college days. Here's one. He looks like he's matured a little bit since <laughs> that first picture. Um, Wolf went on to earn a master's degree at Harvard, and he lived and taught for a, a brief while in New York City. I think Tom is the one in the middle with the white shirt. He was quite tall, so and that looks to be one of the taller fellows in the, the picture. Wolf was truly a citizen of the world. He spent much time traveling abroad, uh, and he began writing Look Homeward Angel in Europe in 1925 while he was there. And the uh, novel was originally titled Oh Lost, hence the, the title of tonight's um, affair. When the novel was published in 1929, just 11 days before the stock market crash, 
It had received positive reviews in North America and eventually would become a bestseller in England and in Germany. But back home in Asheville, folks weren't too happy. Uh, the largely autobiographical novel uh, was criticized for its unflattering portrait of family members and the residents of, of Asheville. Supposedly, Wolf received death threats and ended up staying away from Asheville for a period of eight years. Look Homer and Angel is a coming of age story of Eugene Gant, uh, a character who's thought to be a depiction of, of Wolf himself and it's set in the fictional town of Altamont, which is a thinly disguised version of Asheville. Uh, the novel follows Eugene from birth to 19, and Look Homeward Angel is famous for its um, emotional power, its rhapsodic prose about lost youth in the early part of the 20th century. It's also a few hundred pages long, and my students had to read all of it last fall. I usually teach shorter works by Wolf, but we, we, we did a good job with, with Look Homeward Angel uh, last fall. The novel also has one of the most vivid portrayals of death from the flu, the 1918 flu, found in modern literature. Wolf wrote often about illness in his fiction, and particularly in Look Homeward Angel, where it figures prominently into the family narrative. His mention of such diseases as tuberculosis, pneumonia, influenza, malaria, typhoid, even mentions leprosy, uh, speaks to the concern that infectious diseases must have held for families uh, during this pre-antibiotic, pre-modern medicine uh, time period. Wolf's family was uh, directly impacted by illness, and they certainly had their share of sickness and loss, including the untimely deaths of Grover Cleveland Wolf and his twin brother, Benjamin Harrison Wolf. Both deaths had a tremendous impact on Wolf and found their way into Wolf's fiction. The death of 12 year old Grover from typhoid fever is thought to have been one of Thomas Wolfe's earliest childhood memories. Wolfe was only four at the time, and it was forever seared in, in his mind. Uh, he recalls being wakened up at night and taken to see uh, his brother's body in the parlor of the uh, boarding house where the family was staying that summer that his mother was operating in St. Louis for the World's Fair. Um, that particular the story is given very uh, sensitive and moving treatment in his novella, The Lost Boy, which you see depicted here. Ben's death, 14 years later, supposedly brought Wolf the greatest grief of his early life. Ben's death was especially difficult for, for Wolf because um, of their close connection. Um, they had, and Ben's death ended up severing probably the most important tie that Wolf had within his very large and tumultuous family. Ben had always championed his talented younger brother and was always urging him to get away and to make something of himself. Here's a picture of, of young Ben. And here's a picture of Ben a little bit older, about three years before the 1918 uh, epidemic in his death. For the most part, Ben's Wolf's uh, life was fairly unremarkable. He dropped out of school after the eighth or ninth grade and went to work for the Asheville Citizen newspaper in somewhat of a dead-end job. I think he sold uh, advertising to local merchants uh, for the newspaper. He later went on to work in Winston-Salem uh, with the newspaper there and his obituary, which you'll see uh, a few slides down the road, refers to him as, as a successful newspaper man. <laughs> In any event, Ben was a quiet, unassuming individual who had a sardonic wit, but like his younger brother Tom, often felt like an outsider to his family. 
in what was a major disappointment to Ben shortly before his death, he had tried enlisting in the Army so he could serve his country in World War I. But unfortunately, weak lungs uh, caused him to be rejected. His lungs were, were bad probably because he was a heavy smoker and maybe because of an underlying uh, tuberculosis infection. <coughs> TB was very prevalent during this era and Asheville was the center for tuberculosis treatment. Many TB patients came and stayed in Asheville and ended up staying in uh, boarding houses, such as Mrs. Wolf's, even though she advertised no sick people. <laughs> when Ben was stricken with the flu, he had returned home from Winston-Salem uh, prior to that to build himself up again so he could try enlisting once more in the, in the Army. At this point, Thomas Wolfe had been back at Chapel Hill for the start of the fall semester in the fall of 1918. And he'd been here for just a few weeks when he received word about his brother's illness. Their sister Effie and her children had come up from South Carolina to visit Mrs. Wolfe at the old Kentucky home. And while here, the children became ill with the flu and spread the infection within the family, including to Ben. In Look Homeward Angel, a letter that Eliza Gant, who is Julia Wolfe's counterpart, sends to her son Eugene at college, which is known as Pulpit Hill, not Chapel Hill in, in the novel, um, conveys a sense of, of just what a big impact the flu had on the Gant family in the novel, but also the town where they lived. The letter also suggests the, the contagiousness of the flu and just how lethal it was as well. I'd like to read to you uh, some, some from that letter. Daisy, who is Effie in real life, Daisy has been here with all of her tribe. She went home t two days ago, leaving Caroline and Richard. They have all been down sick with the flu. We've had a siege of it here. Everyone has had it and you never know who's going to be next. It seems to get the big strong ones first. Mr. Hanby, the Methodist minister, died last week. Pneumonia set in. He was a fine, healthy man in the prime of life. A week later, Eugene, who's still at college, receives a telegram from his mother that is far more ominous. It simply reads, come home at once, Ben has pneumonia. As you've already heard, um, influenza was sweeping the state. And Thomas Wolfe, who was at college here, received the same telegram and headed home. Uh, the flu had made its way from Wilmington through the army camps, military camps in the state. It came here, took two of the presidents, and eventually headed west to the mountains. Newspaper articles from the days leading up to Ben's death on October 19th, I don't know if you can read all the headlines, but the, this front page of the newspaper, it seems to alternate articles about the flu, uh, the flu uh, hitting Asheville and the war in Europe. So two big, you know, two big stories uh, going on. But the newspaper articles show just how besieged Asheville and Buncombe County were by the flu. Each day the Asheville newspaper reported on flu deaths alongside the news of, of war in Europe. And in its around town section of the paper, which I guess is sort of like a society column or a social column, it listed uh, the names of people who were sickened by the flu, who were progressing in their recovery from the flu, and you see a, a death or two mentioned uh, from the flu in, in the society column. The newspaper also contained many advertisements for flu remedies. Uh, I had so much fun looking through these old newspapers and, and the many, many advertisements for products, and I've got a few to show you. Uh, tonight, I wish I had some of Dr. Bell's pine tar honey. Maybe that would help with uh, the pollen and the scratchy throat I have. Um, also, Tanlac tonic, a stomach tonic, was touted as a, as a remedy for the flu. And I think it was in use until the 1940s, but it never was shown to have any real benefit um, at all. 
some other ones, uh, Vicks Vapor Rub, which we've already heard about. Uh, and it was developed here in North Carolina. Isn't that correct, Howard? And there were over 20 formulations of Vicks Vapor Rub in the early part of the 20th century. My mother still uses it. She's almost 93, and she does not go without her Vicks Vapor Rub. Maybe that's why she's 93. <laughs> um, Here's an advertisement that links uh, VIX and the flu and war. Uh, and if you see the, the, what looks like a newspaper column in the headline, Spanish influenza, a new name for an old familiar disease. Simply the same old grip that has swept over the world time and again. The last epidemic in the United States was in 1889 and to 90. That whole column is an advertisement for VIX vapor rub. Uh, I noticed in looking at the newspapers, so often the advertisements read as scary articles, and they had scary headlines. Here's another one. Spanish influenza rapidly spreading, persons weak and run down, easy victims. Fortify yourself against it by taking Tanlac. That was one of the syrup I showed you earlier. Uh, the middle one is for a laxative, which should help you with the flu. <laughs> but I think my favorite is the one from the Asheville Bootery, a preventative dry feed, and it touted leather shoes as giving you protection against the flu, <laughs> keeping your feet dry. <laughs> On October 13th, about a week before Ben's death, the Red Cross in Asheville issued an emergency call for volunteers, for doctors, nurses, cooks, housekeepers, uh, people who could help uh, keep uh, people from Asheville, quote, from dying from starvation and other, a lack of other attention. That's really scary, you know, to think that a flu outbreak is going to cause people to die from starvation. Uh, the call for volunteers that you see, I typed it out over here on the side. Because there was no mandatory reporting of, of the flu in, in this area, it's hard to know its full impact on Asheville. But Health Officer Dr. Reynolds, when he spoke to the North Carolina Medical Society in April 1919, provided the figures you see here. Uh, Asheville had a population of about 30,000. It reported almost 4,800 flu cases and 127 deaths. I saw another source that put the total of deaths at about, 100, I think, 158. But that may have been outside of Asheville in um, the surrounding area. Um, Dr. Reynolds put the infection rate at 15.8%, which was slightly less than the 20% rate that North Carolina suffered uh, during that time, and the death rate at 3.3%. Maybe Asheville fared a little bit better because they had more time to prepare as the flu crept across the state, uh, but they waited for it in terrible dread. And Dr. Reynolds, in uh, his talk to the Medical Society, spoke about how utterly hopeless uh, they felt in Asheville with the flu heading their way. When Thomas Wolfe arrived home from college, he found his family in turmoil. And the family uh, and his brother, Ben, in a desperate condition fighting for every breath. At this point, Ben had pneumonia in both lungs and was dying. Family members gathered around Ben's sick bed in the uh, old Kentucky home in an upstairs bedroom. And these family members included uh, his brother Fred, who was out of the Navy and home from Ohio, his sister Mabel, who had helped care for Ben during his illness and who was, had worked herself almost to the point of exhaustion, and family patriarch W.O. Wolf, who by this point in his life was too old and feeble to get up to the second floor and had to be helped up, hoisted up, as was one, described in one place, uh, to be where Ben lay dying. Julia Wolf, whom you see in the picture, these are in their younger years, uh, was absent from her son's bedside. 
as Ben had refused to allow her in the room. Family members blamed Julia Wool for Ben's condition, uh, citing her customary stinginess in creating a delay in getting the doctor to come check on him once his influenza turned into pneumonia. When Tom arrived at his brother's bedside, Ben grasped his hands and said, why have you come home? Why have you come home? Which indicates that he was beginning to realize just how seriously ill he was. Wolf devotes an entire chapter of Look Homeward Angel to Ben's death, uh, about 18 pages, a fact that underscores its significance in the novel, but also in Wolf's life. The fictional account of Ben's death, which Wolf, Wolf witnessed firsthand, provides a vivid clinical and artistic picture of uh, the flu. By piecing together bits of information from the chapter, I was able to figure out that <coughs> Ben's death illness and death probably spanned about eight or nine days, uh, which seems long compared to other stories that we've heard. But I'd like to uh, give you, and that's been in the, in the novel, been in real life. I'm not sure, I, I, I'm not sure what his did, but if, if Wolf's accounting in the novel matches reality, then it was about eight or nine days. And I'd like to give you um, the sequence of those events to show you the course of his illness. After contracting the flu, Ben, quote, mopes around ill and feverish for a day or two. He then goes to bed for two days and is taken care of by his lover, Fanny Pert. By day five, Ben seems to be improving. And the doctor who visits at the time tells him he can get up if he wants to. Ben gets up, he storms around the house for a day, but by the next day, he's back in bed with a high fever. As the pneumonia develops, Ben languishes in bed for another two days before Dr. Coker is called in to help, and by then, it's too late. Ben's death occurs a day or two later. In portraying Ben's death, Wolf depicts the deadly, fulminating pneumonia that struck many influenzas during the 1918 epidemic. And his description, I think, conveys the ter terrific respiratory and physical agony that his uh, brother must have faced. And I'd like to read you that description. Ben's long, thin body was bitterly twisted below the covers in an attitude of struggle and torture. It seemed not to belong to him. It was somehow distorted and detached as if it belonged to a beheaded criminal. And the sallow yellow of his face had turned gray. Out of this granite tin of death, lit by two red flags of fever, the stiff black furs of a three-day beard was growing. Ben's thin lips were lifted in a constant grimace of torture and strangulation above his white, somehow dead-looking teeth, as inch by inch he gasped a thread of air into his lungs. As Ben's condition worsens, the family gathers um, and, and is caught in a grip of fear and uncertainty. Tensions run high, petty squabbles break out, and their hopes rise and fall as the hours pass. Uh, Eugene and, and his brother Luke, um, in the novel, paced the hall smoking cigarettes, which surely could not have been of benefit uh, at the time. Sister Helen goes in and out of the sick room trying to will her brother to live. Family mis members listen through the door to Ben's gasping breathing as he struggles to force air into what Wolf describes as his cemented lungs. It's an awful sound. At one point, Eugene and Luke rush to the local pharmacy for an oxygen tank. Uh, they return home, but it's been resisted, and I don't think it's of much value. Uh, Wolf notes other details of Ben's physical symptoms, including his restlessness, his delirium, his movement in and out of consciousness, um, and the various forms of respiration that he endures, including coughing, gasping, shallow breathing, and the terminal secretions, or the death rattle that's 
indicates that the end is near. Um, in desperation, Helen asks Dr. Coker if something more can be done for her brother, and Dr. Coker replies, no, it's hopeless, it's too late. Um, and in my favorite passage from, from the chapter, Dr. Coker tells Helen, quote, we can't turn back to the hours when our lungs were sound, our blood hot, our bodies young. We are a flash of fire, a brain, a heart, a spirit. And in words that I'm sure applied to other victims of the 1918 flu, Dr. Coker tells Helen, my dear girl, he's drowning, drowning. Ben doesn't die for another two pages. Wolf uses those two pages not so much to talk about Ben, but to talk about the family and all that they're going through, the upheaval, the, the, the petty squabbles that break out. Um, but he also conveys their growing sense of loss as the end approaches. And one of the most moving parts to me is his uh, representation of maternal grief uh, when Eliza, uh, is allowed back into the room uh, with her son and sits beside him. Uh, Wolf writes, she appeared to be watching her own death. Ben was not dying, but that a part of her life, her blood, her body was dying. A short while later, Ben's breathing appears to cease. His body seems to grow rigid and the family thinks he's passed on. Um, but Suddenly, a, a very extraordinary transformation takes place, uh, and I think it, this part is when Wolf describes the moment of Ben's death, and it's a very evocative and memorable death scene. Probably, <coughs> certainly, of all the novels I've read in over my lifetime, this is the one death scene that I, I remember and can recall so vividly. Um, Here's what Wolf writes. Suddenly, marvelously, as if his resurrection and rebirth had come upon him, Ben drew upon the air in a long and powerful respiration. His gray eyes opened. Filled with a terrible vision of all life in one moment, he seemed to rise forward bodilessly from his pillow without support. A flame, a light, a glory. After Ben dies, uh, Wolf immortalizes him as a fallen god. And, but he gives readers a passage that so beautifully captures the bereavement and the disbelief that often follows the death of a loved one. Uh, the language is pure wolf, and it's rendered through Eugene's consciousness. And I won't read you the whole passage, but I'll read you the first line. Uh, Eugene is thinking, we can believe in the nothingness of life. We can believe in the nothingness of death and of life after de death. But who can believe in the nothingness of Ben? I get chills whenever I, I read that, that line. Wolf goes on to describe the um, aftermath of Ben's death, including the continued family squabbles, the visit that Luke and, and Eugene uh, make to the undertaker, the, the funeral, the burial, and the lostness that envelops Eugene and other uh, characters in the novel. Um, Here's a, a picture of where the real Ben uh, is buried, and I think you probably have seen that photo in the earlier slide show. Um, besides the death of Ben, Wolf was touched by the great flu in other ways as well. Uh, we've already heard about how his university was hit by the flu, but he had an early love, a young woman named Clara Paul, who served as the inspiration for the character of Laura James in Look Homeward Angel. This young woman um, ended up marrying another man, moving to Norfolk, Virginia, and subsequently died during the 1918 epidemic. In looking through old newspapers, I came across an obituary for a cousin in Texas, Wesley E. Wolf, who was age 31. Uh, he was a nephew of Wolf's father, W.O. Wolf. Uh, Wesley died after a brief bout of pneumonia in January 1918. His obituary doesn't mention whether the flu was involved, uh, but given the time of year, his age, and his apparent vigor as a cement worker, he's, he's 
much is said about his you know, youth and vigor in, in this obituary, suggests that a strain of the flu, maybe even part of the first wave of the 1918 flu was um, present. Maybe that was behind his early death, uh, quite sudden death in Texas uh, from pneumonia. In the end, Wolf was never able to fully exercise uh, his brother's ghost. Uh, in a letter to his mother in May of 1923, Wolf uh, mentions Ben's death and he tells his mother, this is why I think I'm going to be an artist. Uh, and then after Look Homeward Angel was published in 1929, Wolf told a cousin that he wrote the book for Ben. And he told his sister Mabel, um, and this is a haunting line for me as well, uh, Wolf says, I think the Asheville I knew died for me when Ben died. Uh, later, later, Wolf dedicated this book, From Death to Morning, which was published in 1935 as a collection of stories. He dedicated it to Ben's memory, and I typed out the dedication that appeared on the, inside the, the cover of the book because it's so haunting and loving. Um, and it shows just what a tremendous impact Ben and his life and death uh, had on Thomas Wolfe. Death, uh, Wolfe's own death would follow just three years later. Uh, he died at Johns Hopkins Hospital uh, from tuberculosis of the brain just three weeks shy of his 38th birthday. Like Grover and Ben, Wolf would also be laid to rest in Asheville's rim, uh, Riverside Cemetery. I took this last summer, and I, I hope you can see the pens and pencils that people have left for Tom. Uh, he tended to handwrite everything that he wrote. Uh, I actually have uh, friends in the Wolf Society who told me about the pilgrimages they made as young people to Wolf's grave. One drove all the way from California and arrived and spent the night on Wolf's grave uh, in Riverside. And he's not the only one. Uh, I'm telling you, Wolf people are very devoted and serious. <laughs> in rendering Ben's death in Look Homeward Angel, Wolf re reveals with much intimacy the devastation that the great flu caused his family. Uh, from the onset of flu symptoms to its tragic conclusion. Uh, I think Wolf gives us a, an important narrative, uh, illness narrative of family and place, and in the process transforms deep personal loss into art. Uh, however, as much as anything, I think Ben's death reminds us about the terror that the flu must have held for families in 1918. And that is something we should always remember, even today. Thank you so much. Will you please join me once again in thanking uh, Howard and Paula for their outstanding presentations. And if I could ask them uh, to come forward onto the stage, uh, and this will uh, begin our, uh, our open uh, question and answer period, and would encourage uh, those of you who have a, a question at this point to come forward. Uh, before we do that, uh, I would just like to uh, once again uh, thank uh, a few people. Uh, first of all, our, our, our guests for uh, uh, coming tonight and uh, giving us a, a great uh, renditioning. And also, I'd like to, uh, to thank uh, Dean Barber uh, Reimer uh, for uh, the o organizing uh, uh, this entire week and uh, with her team. <laughs> and, uh, and Vice uh, Provost uh, Elaine Westbrook for uh, being such a gracious uh, host here tonight. So I would uh, like to welcome all of you to uh, the uh, microphone here in the center. And if there's a uh, first question. I have a question. So full disclosure, I'm Marsha Walker. I signed up for this symposium because I'm a Gina Colada freak, and I can't wait to meet her tomorrow. Um, but I've loved hearing from you guys, too. I'm guessing you guys might not be able to answer this question, but maybe someone in the audience could. I volunteer for the Sepsis Alliance. And when I heard about Ben's death, I'm like, 
I think he died from sepsis. And I'm wondering if anyone has ever done research on the link, because people didn't know what sepsis was in 1918, if that was really more the cause of the death than the actual flu. Does anyone know? If not, someone needs to apply for a grant and find out. <laughs> I, I think his was pneumonia. That's all I've ever seen reference to. But he did, you know, of course, have a high fever. And um, so I don't know. The, you know, the symptoms you described, I'm like, that sounds just like sepsis. Yeah. You, you're sick, you get better, then you get really sick yeah. again. But, I th but didn't that happen with the with other cases of the flu in 1918 where people were getting better and then, boom, they got and whether that was sepsis or pneumonia, I'm, I'm not sure. You know, I have a question. It's not about the flu. <laughs> <laughs> I read the books by Wolf, and I've been reading all my life. I've read many authors in French and English. And what I was struck by when I read his books was I was, it was like I was being carried on a wave of words that carried me from one end of the book to the other. And I've never read any other books like that. And I wondered where, we don't get our ideas from nowhere, they come from elsewhere. So I wondered what he read in order to obtain that amazing style of writing. Wolf was widely read, and he read all the great authors and, and was influenced, I think, by many. Um, James Joyce comes to mind. Um, you know, but I think of the ones who loved language. Uh, Walt Whitman. Um, there's some other Wolfians here in the audience. They, they might know Wolf's reading habits better than I did, but he, he was extraordinarily well read. Yeah, I've never read any other book like that. And I don't think there was... There, is anybody who he and he read voraciously and and a lot in one in one sitting in one day. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah. Mr. Covington, um, you mentioned that uh, there was a small uh, cohort of women at the university early on. Can you? I, I had always thought of it as primarily. Mm, admissions for men, who were the women who were here and on what was their admission based and were they graduate students or nursing students? Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, they were an assortment. Actually, there was a woman in Ed Graham, Ed, Edward Kidder Graham's graduating class in 1898. Um, Sally Stoddard, I think was her name. She was the first woman to graduate. Um, Graham's <coughs> Uh, Graham was widowed by the time he died, uh, but his wife was also a student here. Some started during the summer. Uh, they were primarily they began primarily began their education at other institutions, and came here uh, sort of as graduate students, uh, but they were also here uh, learning law. Uh, there were there were law students. Uh, in the teens, so it was a real assortment. There was no, there was no. Um, um, women were not. There was no prohibition against women. <laughs> I guess is what I'm trying to say. They just didn't come here. And if I was a woman, I wouldn't want to be here either. I mean, it was a really rough living on this campus. Those dormitories up there um, had maybe one toilet. Uh, there were a couple of sh some showers over in the car building, but I mean it was it, you didn't it wasn't civilized living, and uh, there wasn't even a decent hotel in town. Uh, with women came here and even visitors came here at their peril. It was uh, it was not a nice place to be. So, uh, but they were an assortment, and it wasn't until the. 20s that women began to arrive in larger numbers uh, and as I said it was Chase who hired uh, who was president when the first two I think there were two women hired to the faculty in 19 in either 1925 or 1926 there was it, it that made the 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 uh, president at the uh, uh, women's college in Greensboro very nervous when Chase started hiring female faculty members and even building a residence hall for, for uh, women students. Uh, because the, um, um, the, the folks in Greensboro thought they had a lock on, all, on educating all women in North Carolina. 
So again, who was the first dean of uh, the women's dean? She was, she was the <laughs> Graham hired, um, uh, her last name is Lingle, in just a minute, uh, Clara Lingle, um, who was a friend, who was the wife of a friend of his, uh, to be sort of a women's liaison in 1917, 1918. Um, she needed a job. Her husband had been dra was in the military, and, and <laughs> so he hired her, someone she had met through his social welfare work. Um, Marvin, she left after the war ended. Marvin Stacy uh, died in January 1919, and his widow was really in bad straits. Clara Lingle had left, so Chase hired uh, Stacy's widow uh, to be, well, she wouldn't really call the dean of women, but it was sort of the, somebody in the front office who women, the women students who were here could come talk to and get help from and get some advice and counseling. And also, I think she did a little missionary work out in, out in the community, um, recruiting more women students. She eventually became the dean of women. She, that was her title that she, she uh, uh, gained sometime in the 20s. She remained dean of women, I think, until her retirement and or death, and I don't know which came, whether that was it came at the same time in the 40s. Mr. Coving, as, uh, as provost here at UNC, I, I tend to worry a little bit about uh, resources. And I'm curious, uh, given the fact that uh, President Chase uh, uh, took over after the war, mm -hmm. and uh, thinking that uh, perhaps the state uh, and the country was somewhat resource deprived, how was he able to uh, garner the resources uh, throughout the 20s uh, to, to build uh, the, this university uh, to the scope that, that, that it became? Well, there's a whole book written about that campaign. It arose almost spontaneously on this campus in the late fall of 1920 um, with a bunch of uh, rattle rousers, mainly Frank Graham, and Lewis Round Wilson and Bob House and other familiar names who said, we've got to get some money from the legislature. And they aroused alumni who uh, started holding meetings that fall. And by the time the legislature came to town, came to Raleigh in January 1921, they had a citizens movement that, uh, I don't know, it's been equaled in 100 years. And they railroaded the legislature into a $20 million uh, down payment on education in North Carolina. Now, $20 million ain't much, unless it's 1921. Um, the university's share of that was about, was supposed to be a little more, was supposed to be a little more than they got. Uh, but they ended up getting 5.5 million out of that. Um, State College got money, uh, Greensboro, um, other institutions um, got money, and that there was an appropriation in 1921, another appropriation in 1923, and by 1925 it has sort of fizzled, uh, but um, it was the largest infusion of cash into education that the state had ever seen. Up to that point, almost all of the buildings on this campus were paid for by private donations. Thank you. This is not a question, but it's um, just an observation that you're listening to two very too modest people. Uh, this is a spoiler alert. <laughs> Sally Stockford, the first woman in 1898. There's a biography that's coming out on her uh, from the Department of Archives and History in Raleigh. A professor at um, Elon University is bringing that out, so we'll get some coverage of her, her 
career was really significant more elsewhere than when she was here. But in Howard's book, he does talk about some of the um, early women here, um, Elizabeth, that you asked, the Daily Tar Heel, big article you, you cite, didn't want women here. I forgot the quote you picked up, but it's like, no rouge and so and so. <laughs> no rats, no rouge. <laughs> that was a reference to their hairdo, uh, to the hairdo of women. Thomas Wolfe and Lost Children in Southern Literature. Yes, and that has got great reviews, not just from the Wolfe people, but from the people. I'm Bob Anthony, I'm with the library here. We can help you put your hands on these books if you come in. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Well, then, can I ask another question? Sure. Um, can each of you share like one writing habit that's worked well for you? like? like Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I asked. And then one that you like learned some a lesson learned that you wish you hadn't done, like, a good and a bad thing. <laughs> I'm a slow writer. I eke it out slowly, but and I think I write, revise, edit all at the same time. By the time I'm finished with something, it's pretty well done. In the early days of writing, I used to beat myself up over being so slow, but I've realized now that, you know, I write to figure out what I know and what I think, and I've trust the process, and I've had good success with that, so I, I don't, you know, question the process anymore. I just let it happen. Um, I, don't, I don't agonize over it. But it's still, I'm not any faster at it. Um, I wish I could be a fast writer, but I need the, the time and the, to think. I would say discipline. Um, having, a, having a schedule and sticking to it. Um, um, there was, William Sapphire used to write a column for the New York Times Magazine and someone asked him the question, how do you write? How do you, how do you, you, you do the production that you do? And he recalled his college, uh, a college course in which he was required to, um, uh, was required to produce a, basically an essay three times a week. Uh, and um, when you come out of a, uh, out of a, out of the rigorous kind of um, routine like that, Writing a 750-word column is a piece of cake. So, I mean, it's training. It's basically setting your mind to, to the task and then sitting down and doing it. Arnold, no, not Arnold Toynbee, who Sapphire quoted somebody in that, in that column as saying he, his, his was a 19th century writer who was said to tie himself to his chair. <laughs> he would sit down to write at 5 or 6 in the morning and he would not get up, and to make sure he didn't get up, he tied himself to his chair until about nine or 10. I do have to clarify that I'm a fast writer when I'm doing uh, administrative reports. I can crank those out in no time. Uh, but, the, but the creative work, it, it takes time, and, and I'm, I think I'm fairly disciplined. I can you know, sit down and work all day for, for eight hours, and. Uh, you know, not get too distracted. I'm, I'm fairly disciplined too, uh, but it does take time and to, to think and to write, but not with the annual reports that I have coming up in the few weeks, and <laughs> I'm sure some of you here know about those as well. <laughs> well, please join me in, uh, in thanking Paula and Howard once again. And I'd like to thank all of you for, uh, for coming out uh, tonight. And uh, I'm sure uh, you'll, you'll enjoy the remainder of the uh, Go Viral program for the remainder of the week. Thank you very much. That's good.